we also saw in the first slide that we are having innovations from 2010 onwards which are going to drive the new startup space. Now when we talk about innovation, innovation has uh, two sides of coin. One is innovation, the other is perfection. A highly innovative product and a highly perfect product which is uh, pr preferred by the marketplace. So when we look at the products in terms of these two grids, that is innovation and perfection, we can look, look at a grid which has low innovation as well as low perfection. Obviously, this will be the cheapest to make and cheapest to buy, but also easily discarded in terms of customer loyalty. It will have low one-time design costs, it will have low recurring manufacturing costs, lowest acquisition cost, but also lowest lifetime value for the customer. So what would the customer do? There is a low launch time buying and rapidly declining product life cycle. Now you can look at a variant for this where the innovation level is very high but the perfection level is not so high. So when the innovation level is very high what would happen? The design cost will be high therefore there would be high one time design cost. Because the perfection level is low the manufacturing tolerances, the machine sophistication could be little lower than what is expected of a high perfection product therefore the recurring cost could be lower. Therefore the medium acquisition cost would be there but there will be a lower uh, lifetime value for the customer. So when this happens because of the innovation that is ingrained in the product or manifest in the product there will be a high surge buying when this product is uh, launched but the demand rise will be on a low slow play. A variant of that model could be high perfection and low innovation that is uh, reverting to a pen, a pen which has always been in existence has been made to much higher order of uh, perfection therefore there is a persistent buying as people start recognizing that this product although known is providing you greater value of uh, uh, lifetime uh, possession for the customer. Therefore, you have low one-time design costs in this, high recurring manufacturing costs because you are pursuing perfection, medium acquisition cost but again low lifetime value for the customer. So these are the two variants. One would say that most of the products fall into this kind of surge buying mode or low buying mode but going up with the passage of time. But when we spoke of the blockbuster products, they are the products which have high innovation and also high perfection. So they have high <coughs> one time design costs, they also have high ma recurring manufacturing costs but they offer the highest lifetime value for the customer th despite the high acquisition cost. And these are the products which we called earlier, these are the blockbuster products with sustainable success. Now what does a startup do? Startup uh, could aim to do a blockbuster product straight away but the startup can also find out ways and means how products can move from low low quadrant to high low quadrant or low high quadrant or eventually to low high quadrant. So the way you analyze a product in terms of the core inerts and also the peripheral inerts and make sure that you have got the technologies to upgrade those products either in terms of innovation or perfection or both that is a startup opportunity which you get. So this innovation perfection matrix is one kind of uh, platform by which you analyze your opportunities. Now this perfect innovation is something which we need to have uh, as a goal. The blockbuster product we said is a perfectly innovative product. You can also say it is an innovatively perfect product whichever as it is. So we in this uh, design concept we will have perfection as the goal and perfection as the result. But in between the goal and the outcome we have materials, components, subsystems, systems and product which are designed and developed which are manufactured and delivered. And the whole thing is within a framework what we considered earlier of design thinking in terms of ideation, empathizing with the customer and ensuring how all of these internal components develop a product which meet customer requirements to the most satisfying extent. But for that to happen as a value chain, as a regular industrial activity you also need concurrent design and manufacture. So you have got a value chain which should be understood in totality. You should have design and development uh, ability which brings out those kinds of components and the end product. A manufacturing and delivery system which provides the product. 
which happens by adopting two philosophies simultaneously one philosophy of design thinking and the other philosophy of concurrent design and manufacture so perfect innovation yes is a very fascinating and uh, uh, elusive concept in a way but even if innovation happens at every point of a product value chain it is an elusive concept because innovation doesn't uh, stand still when a normal cell phone was invented it was an innovation but it is no longer innovation when you have the smartest uh, featured phone that is considered the innovation a foldable phone is considered the next uh, stage of innovation so the innovation as a movement doesn't uh, stand still therefore uh, it's an elusive concept but it is a goal which every startup every big company should uh, aim at so i would suggest that we should aim at perfect innovation as a time still concept that is if time were to freeze at this point of time what is the perfectly innovative product which could which we could make and we should combine precision and innovation in materials manufacturing and delivery to produce this kind of product now what kinds of perfection we can think of there are two kinds of uh, perfection one is the iterative perfection this we discussed at length when we talked about minimum viable product how the first product gives a kind of uh, proof of concept then we have the next level of product which gives more features normally we also call in the startup uh, lexicon prototype 1 prototype 2 prototype 3 or level 1 prototype level 2 prototype level 3 prototype etc so when we do this iterative perfection of a minimum viable product and later on once the poc is established the ultimate desirable product we are honing the prototype to perfection we are also homologating the product to different uh, usage conditions and different regulatory requirements we are also developing the product to ensure that we have commercial manufacturing because when you do a prototype if a jig is malfunctioning we can adjust the jig manually and then produce the component however in commercial manufacture you cannot afford to do that because it will stop the manufacturing line therefore iterative per perfection requires adjustment to ensure that the commercial manufacture is completely done then we have conceptual redefinition that is market may not be realizing the importance of either perfection or innovation or the combination of perfection and innovation then we need to do repositioning of the product and ensure that the new technology substrate which comes out of this perfect innovation is understood by the market that's the other area for example you look at uh, robotic surgery it's an example of perfect innovation so once upon a time not so long ago people would have thought that it is impossible for a machine to conduct a surgery but then when you think of a machine being better than the human hand because there is no shake which is involved in a machine then you understand that yes there is a principle in robotic surgery which must be taken to its logical conclusion so when the doctor's uh, human judgment is is combined with the surgical uh, precision of the robot you get a perfectly innovative product and that perfectly innovative product will keep on take going to the next lap next lap of perfection and so on today's robo surgery for example is different for different kinds of uh, surgeries a robo surgery for uh, heart is quite different from a robo surgery for uh, thigh and the manipulations that are being required for these two types of surgeries completely differ in their characteristic and in their complexities therefore it is being customized but tomorrow you may have a universally applicable robotic surgery equipment so that is the way things will go then finally the operational delivery having the conceptual repositioning is fine iterative perfection of either the established product or the new product like robo machine is fine but then how do you actually deliver in terms of operations the access to the technology to the entire organization bill of materials bill of innovation and manufacturing perfection when we look at completely autonomous automobile that is level 5 automation we, we can again think of that being perfect innovation because you got to be very precise how you measured the distances how you measured the traffic conditions how you pictured the various objects whether they are uh, inanimate objects like cars or animate objects or living objects like uh, human beings and other uh, living uh, bodies how we do you really capture those things into your system that there has to be perfection and there has to be perfection also how this information is processed 
and then a judgment is made by the driverless car as to how it should conduct itself. So there is a huge amount of work which goes inside within the design and development of the car to achieve perfect innovation. So there are some areas where perfect innovation is not a kind of philosophical goal, it is very much a required goal and the world is moving into that direction where surgery is automated, where driving is automated, where whether uh, prediction is automated, where uh, medical treatment is automated, when that happens you need to have perfectly innovative products and that is where uh, individual components also have to be perfectly innovative, another big area for startups to come. So when we look at innovation, innovation comes in three ways, one is uh, imagination, second is visualization, third is disruption. Why is this important to startups? This is important to startup because startup has two components, one definition of a problem and presentation of a solution. That the entire pitch deck of a startup can be just summed up in one slide which talks about very innovative solution for a very unknown or very vexatious problem. So how do you solve this riddle? And to be able to do that, you have to be very imaginative, you have to be able to have visualization skills and you should also produce products which can disrupt the existing way. So imagination of uh, flying in the air is one type of imagination. Visualizing how you would fly, looking at the bird and then mimicking its char characteristic, that is visualization. And when you apply those concepts from different uh, industries, different uh, product lines to take on this challenge, then it leads to disruptive technology. And what was imagined earlier may not be imagined now, but a completely new activity could be imagined. So we say horses for courses, so we say that airplane is for flying in the air and car is for uh, running on the road. But when we say that uh, we are having traffic uh, log jams, gridlocks, therefore we need a flying car, then you are setting imagination to a new level. And when you do the imagination to the new level, you got to visualize how would it be. Obviously it can't be exactly the same car which just flies off, it could be a different kind of car. It would be probably a crossover between uh, drone and an automobile. Now when you do that, how would you disrupt the industry? You disrupt the industry by borrowing concepts and technologies from allied industries or non-allied industry. You take concepts from space technology, you take concepts from aeronautics, you take concepts from uh, chemical industry and then you develop a product which is a flying car. But the key thing in this is that most of the innovation is triggered by assessment of nature, it is also triggered by how the market evolves and how ready the market is. We have had uh, let us say amphibian and vehicles for quite some time. That is vehicles which are uh, on the water and which can also take off and again land back into the water. So having done that uh, few decades ago, why should flying car come only now? That is because flying cars are being generated as a requirement of a gridlock traffic system. So as long as the traffic was moving smoothly, there was no need for a flying car. But when the traffic is gridlocked, there is all the need for a flying car. So the market determines or the ecosystem determines when a new startup idea becomes viable. And we have got several uh, ideas by which uh, disruption can take place from wall to diode in the very old radios, from diode to chip, manual coding to machine learning, mainframe to desktop, desktop to laptop, device storage to cloud storage, there is all disruption. And all of these things brought different technologies from different industries to make this happen. Now there are three types of horizon which happen. So the startup has to decide whether I will be in incremental innovation horizon, I should be in the breakthrough innovation horizon or in the disruptive innovation horizon. Now when we look at uh, Euro 6 automobile, that is an innovation which ensures that the particulate matter is at the lowest level apart from other improvements in OX and others is an incremental innovation because the same set of technology you are improving further. You are not changing the engine configuration but definitely you are substituting mechanical fuel injection by electronic fuel injection. You are improving the fuel quality, 
you are improving the micro mixing system which happens in the engine therefore you are achieving incremental innovation then there is a breakthrough innovation no one thought of putting an electric motor two decades ago in a car and then optimizing between the ic engine as well as the electric motor which toyota did with the prius so it's a breakthrough innovation but a complete disruptive innovation is one which will transform the entire industry and it, it eliminates the existing uh, product tankers by completely new ones for example autonomous vehicle which is also electric vehicle so when these things happen whether they happen and therefore there are opportunities for startups or startups provide the wherewithal for the companies to take these innovations forward it is a kind of catch 22 situation but ideal ecosystem both from the end product Uh, viewpoint as well as from the component viewpoint developments occur simultaneously so that there is a good match when you want to change transform the industry now established firms prefer to work in silos they prefer to maximize efficiency within the operating business construct rather than disrupting the successful businesses with voluntary self mediated disruptive action that's the given fact generally no industry particularly one which has achieved high level of uh, scale and scope would like to disrupt itself by saying that i have gone i have found out a completely new way of uh, doing this service to the society for example a soap manufacturer who is number one in manufacture of soap would not say that manufacturing soaps or a soap as a product is no longer the right way you need to use some other uh, system you could do that as an adjunct product but not necessarily as a completely substitute product so the business economics fight against such kind of disruptive innovation mediated by the company by itself that's where the startups come in because they have no such legacy they have no such restraints they have no such constraints they can come up with their own innovations and ensure that the innovation which is there in the peripheral segments are brought into the mainstream and eventually overwhelm the overall market now when we talk about innovation can we forget about imitation Imita- imitation also exists startups can f- work in the imitation space also i told earlier that imitation occurs so when we talk about innovation we think of imitation as a poor cousin of uh, innovation but then imitation also is essential for uh, societal growth and imitation is also not one where uh, startups can say that i'm going to keep off uh, completely because imitation itself has uh, three areas one is a replicative imitation second is an improving imitation third is a creative imitation replicative imitation is spec to spec copying obviously there is no great uh, technological thought or uh, manufacturing thought involved in that and it ensures price competitiveness but improving imitation is uh, having notable uh, improvements in the product but not again breakthrough innovations and it creates a new exclusive brand identity that's possible and the third one is creative innovation which creates a new sub- sub segment within the known segment for example you have got uh, uh, a capsule medicine but then you create a medicine which can have vegetable uh, capsule not uh, no hint of any uh, non vegetable uh, ingredient in the capsule so you have imitated it but you have creatively imitated it by putting in a new level of differentiation within the existing framework so that is creative imitation because the basic product which is inside the capsule is the same so you have worked on an axillary uh, component to take the product to a new segment so any high level philosophy when we talk about innovation when we concede the fact that it is nothing but mimicking of the nature we can say that even innovation is uh, imitation of the nature so given that kind of philosophical overtone we should say that imitation is also important imitation is also worthwhile for startups to enter their field but to the extent that startups tend to use technology for discovering uh, new solutions for uh, less known problems but very important problems i would say that uh, replicative in- imitation is left to the ordinary course of entrepreneurship and improving imitation and creative imitation could come to some extent within the ambit of uh, startup activity and we have to be also conscious of the fact that when imitation becomes toxic then the whole uh, structure of the industry becomes uh, faltering 
when we look at the indian pharmaceutical industry the generic pharmaceutical industry one would be surprised that we have got as many as 6000 plus brands in gastrointestinal space more than 3900 brands in cardiac and 6200 brands in anti infectives just for example now this many brands have to be promoted to the doctors by a legion of uh, uh, medical representatives on ground and would it be possible to achieve any amount of uh, scale economics scope economics except for the top 5 or 10 uh, companies in the pharmaceutical field therefore unbridled limitation can be self destructive to an industry when it undermines the ability to meaningfully imitate on any of the three horizons of imitation because every brand of this 6000 is exactly the same as the other brand in terms of the basic characteristics of the medicine the name of the medicine and uh, packaging so startups could come up with the way where this imitation toxicity is detoxified and that could happen in two ways one way for example is a better way of detailing the other way is to collect data on the efficacy of what seems to be replicative generic medicine but actually having an impact in terms of better patient care in certain cases which means that the underlying quality which cannot be found out is being found out by the doctor through the deployment of the medicine for the patient and the feedback from the patient in terms of the improvement so here again there is lot of uh, data collection big data and analytics involved and that's where the startup uh, has a role to play so again if it is innovation there is obviously a role for startups if uh, imitation there is a role for startups but the roles that are played are completely different earlier also we looked at uh, where how startups can uh, improve or enhance digital by sell but the same startup movement can ensure that that enhanced the digital uh, by sell uh, levels do not harm the environment beyond a particular point so there is some kind of universality in the startup phenomenon so if you take the view that uh, the society needs a philosophical balance between innovation and imitation innovation being incremental breakthrough and disruptive imitation being replicative improving and creative and when we design a product should we innovate across the value chain innovate just for the product or innovate in a niche now you have got a huge uh, set of uh, options for you as a startup to see where your product or your service can be positioned so the hypothesis is that when the paths of innovation and in imitation cross the society benefits because the markets are also poised with a large bottom and a huge middle developing middle and a small apex so you can say that uh, if you look at a market like india you have got uh, the us at the top which is a highly developed market then you may be having a less developed uh, market in the middle and most undeveloped market in the uh, bottom foundation but everybody needs a good product a base level of quality is required a, a base level of service delivery is required and innovation helps you achieve that universally across the product range but the same innovation helps customize the product for different areas so if you look at a uh, uh, fruit beverage a fruit beverage which stays on for uh, one month without refrigeration helps the larger population whereas a fruit beverage which has got the lowest level of or no level of preservatives is cold pressed raw meat but can only stay for one day meets the requirements of the apex so certain levels of innovation certain types of innovation help develop certain types of products which meet certain market requirements whereas other types of innovation help the same product be available for the large population which can afford lower levels of price only but also require the same level of nutrition and the same level of uh, satisfaction of taking a beverage and once that is done particularly in the middle and uh, lower brands number of imitators coming they try to flood the market with their own products so when an innovator develops a market develops a product line he opens up the path then a huge flood of uh, imitators come in 
and they expand the market and make the product available to the larger population of society. So I would say that the brilliant mind of an artful imitator is no less important to this world than the exceptional mind of a creative innovator and vice versa in a philosophical sense. Now the startup would be a good bridge between an artful innovator and a creative imitator. Would be a bridge between an artful imitator and a creative innovator. And a startup which has got uh, low resources but has creativity could be a, an artful imitator to start. And, an start and a startup which is very well funded, which has got lots of technologies and is willing to take up a huge risk could be a creative innovator. And when that happens, then you will find that the society is uh, not satisfied with the just 7,000, 10,000 startups we have, but they may need 100,000 startups. So that's how the startup movement becomes virtuous when it covers every aspect of innovation, imitation, and every segment of the market from the luxurious market to the most uh, common man's uh, market.